Good morning, everyone. <laughs> everyone ready for another exciting blast into the cosmos? <laughs> Did, were you here last night? A lot of you here last night? Yeah? yeah? I know. Wasn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing how he can just download that information and it comes flowing through him? You ever hear an um or a pause or a... It's just absolutely incredible, isn't it? <laughs> what, what did you do? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's two different people. <laughs> so anyway, we're so glad to have you all here again, and welcome to all the people in the teleconference. We have people here from... Um, Israel, Belgium, Turkey, Switzerland. Switzerland, Australia, all different parts of the world. Germany, Germany Europe, Japan. 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 Right, right. Yeah. It's you know, it's like San a Diego. <laughs> San Diego. <laughs> a truly foreign country. It, it, it's a it's a pilgrimage, you know. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's just great to have everyone here and of course our our ET friends that are joining us and helping to make this a true galactic event. So today's topic, this morning Bashar is going to be talking about um, being a whole person. So if you left any of your parts somewhere <laughs> else, be prepared to regroup and remember them. <clears throat> and um, then this afternoon we're going to hear more about the agenda and what's coming in the next 10 years because I would imagine everyone has noticed the acceleration we're experiencing and, and how critical it is to be following your excitement during this time. Um, and oh, the last thing, I had a number of people that were asking me about the whale trip. And so I'm just going to tell you just a few minutes about that. Um, when this happens 80 miles out to sea off the shore of the Dominican Republic, it's on a liveaboard boat which is a, it's a huge boat, so you actually have a real bed and everything like that. And you spend, it's about five to seven days where you're living aboard the boat, and then every morning you go out and we look for whales. And then we do what's called a soft in-water encounter, where we get in the water, we don't swim with them, we float on the surface, and we just hang with the whales. And eventually what happens a lot of times is they get closer and closer. And sometimes the moms will actually use us as babysitters for her babies. And the baby will come over and swim over and flop over on its back and look at us. They look at us like little wild horses, like, wow, what are you, you know? It's just incredible to be looked at by a whale. Because they are about 40 feet long, so it's kind of like a bus, you know? So anyway, so those that are interested, just go ahead and email me, and we'll see what we can put together for February of next year. So thank you all again for coming, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Daryl and Bashar, and just thank you both for being incredibly talented. Oh, shucks. And... <laughs> You know, just having this wonderful ability that is helping to bring so much light to our planet. So thank you, Daryl and Bashar. Thank you. Thank you all for making it possible. Well, thank you all very much for being here so I can do it. And have a good time. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.
much and good day to you this day of your time. Uh, how are you all? Uh, we will take that as an okay. <clears throat> we thank you once again each and every one of you and all of you together collectively for the co-creation of this interaction that affords us an opportunity to experience through all of you many more facets of the multidimensional crystal of all that is. <clears throat> so we thank you for expanding our awareness of all the different ways that creation can express itself. Let us begin with the understanding and the idea <clears throat> and the sharing that has to do with the relationship between physical mind and higher mind, <clears throat> functioning as a whole person. Now, each and every one of you made a choice, a choice to experience <clears throat> physical reality, to live a physical life. When that choice is made from spirit, from the non-physical level, what you do, generally speaking, whether it be <clears throat> in full consciousness or automatically, is you'll begin to lay out a foundation in what might be referred to as a template level reality. <clears throat> a frequency, a domain of reality, just above physical reality. <clears throat> what some might refer to as a lower astral realm. <clears throat> in this template reality, <clears throat> energy, vibrations, <clears throat> are somewhat slower than the idea of higher spiritual realms, but not quite as slow, not quite as dense as physiological reality. Nevertheless, it's close enough so that it can be used as a template to set up certain scenarios to play out, to blueprint certain scenarios that will be experienced in the physical reality to come. By setting up these scenarios, these themes for exploration in the template reality, you thus create a kind of automatic function that allows you to focus on the experience and exploration of that theme when you are in physical reality without having to think too much about how that's being done. It's part of the creation of the consensus agreement. That happens in the template level reality where you all agree to create certain similar circumstances, certain similar conditions by which you will all experience physical reality. It's the level on which you all generally agree to the general rules by which you will play the physical reality game. <clears throat> Once then that has been established <clears throat> in template fashion and set into place, <clears throat> your consciousness then in a sense passes through that template on its way to physical reality, on its way to crystallizing yourself into physical materiality, bonding with the idea of the physical body, consolidating down to that focus. And by passing through that template level, you take on the attributes of the general agreed upon reality. <clears throat> you start to imbue yourself and infuse your consciousness with a structure you crystallize a particular structure that is representative of that reality in which you will have an experience. <clears throat> a similar analogy would be to you that you are deciding <clears throat> to go deep sea diving and you must then prepare by putting on the proper wetsuit, putting on the proper diving apparatus and your breathing equipment. <clears throat> you prepare yourself for the environment into which you are about to plunge. Thus then, as you lower yourself, regulate your air, so on and so forth, become accustomed to the deeper pressure below the sea, so too, in a sense, do you become more accustomed by this crystallization process to the idea of the experience of physicalizing yourself and the limitations that go with that. Now, remember, even though this life, for most of you, is all about letting go of many of your limitations, many of them still serve a purpose. They still serve to keep you focused in physical reality. 
So the, just the concept itself of limitation is not inherently a negative one. What you do with that concept can be positive or negative. <clears throat> Nevertheless, getting back to the idea of this progression, <clears throat> as you thus then connect to the idea <clears throat> of the physical seed that is being born, to create a bonding with the concept of a body. As you crystallize your spirit into that physicality, you actually aid and assist in the formation of that embryonic form, imbuing it with many of the crystallization ideas you have brought with you as spirit, and you work with that embryonic body in your mother's wombs to create the being, the personality structure that will best exemplify the themes that you chose to explore in the reality. While working in that sense with that embryonic structure, you will find that most of the template ideas, most of the thematic ideas that you will explore in physical reality that you thus then <clears throat> crystallize into that embryonic body are done after, on or after the 49th day of the existence of that embryo. <clears throat> Up to that point, the embryo structure does not have the capacity to lock in those template ideas. Because what has not yet formed in the embryo is the necessary and essential and crucial pineal gland. Once the pineal gland exists, <clears throat> Because it is, in the brain, the gateway and the doorway between higher and lower realities, it is necessary for it to be there in the embryo <clears throat> to function as the gland that incorporates those template ideas and thus then starts to arrange the idea of the neurology of the brain in such a manner and the cellular structure of the body in such a manner as to <clears throat> be conducive to the ideas and the themes that are being crystallized in that body. <clears throat> Once the embryonic form then <clears throat> is sufficiently organized to be a match for the frequencies that are representative of the kind of experiences and themes you have chosen to explore in physical reality, there then starts to become <clears throat> more and more and more <clears throat> a solid vibrational link between the idea of the physical form and the spirit form. Now, this will still be somewhat tenuous for quite some time. <clears throat> Even children <clears throat> that are born will have, generally speaking, anywhere from <clears throat> three to seven years to decide if they actually wish to play out that physical life even longer before the idea of the vibrational link between spirit and body becomes relatively cohesive and relatively unbreakable. But especially up to the age of three, you will find <clears throat> that many spirits may have only wanted to experience a little tiny bit of physical reality, just want to, in a sense, get their so-called spiritual feet wet, but don't necessarily want to have <clears throat> a full lifespan. So you will find <clears throat> that many individuals who are still very young will simply choose one day to leave. This is not the only reason, but it is one of the major reasons for what many individuals on your planet call unexpected crib death. They will just have lived out the span that they chose to live, and they will simply go back into spirit. <clears throat> the idea also of what you might refer to as either miscarriage or abortion is also something that, in a sense, serves the spirit's purpose of choosing someone who wouldn't necessarily choose to have a full-term child, and thus by forming a link with a person who has made that kind of a choice, they will get to experience just the portion of physical existence that they chose to experience, and no more. <clears throat> now, this is not in any way, shape, or form a commentary on that kind of choice. It is simply saying that nothing goes to waste, and in that sense, it all serves some spirit's purpose. So in that sense, doesn't need to be looked at in any kind of a judgmental way. <clears throat> it is simply a choice, a circumstance, and an opportunity that is taken advantage of by those it can serve. <clears throat> now, as you further crystallize 
the embryonic form, and it starts to set up cellular structures and neurological pathways in the physical body that are representative of the kind of themes you will explore, what it also starts to create <clears throat> is the personality construct. <clears throat> the representation of the intelligence of the spirit, the consciousness of the spirit, will in a sense be mocked up in the body. <clears throat> it will have a <clears throat> template form of its own that is represented by the capacity for belief systems, emotions, and thought patterns and actions. This prismatic template in the brain is set up to receive certain kinds of information that are conducive to the expression of that spirit's choice of thematic experiences. Thus, that personality becomes uniquely fixed and uniquely capable of expressing itself along the lines specifically of the themes that were chosen for exploration. This is not to say that the personality cannot be malleable, for it is. <clears throat> but the idea is, is that it is specifically designed to absorb information <clears throat> that is along the lines of the chosen themes. Now, of course, <clears throat> when a child on your planet is born <clears throat> to its parents, it will because it is still absorbing, still laying the foundations of that template, still crystallizing, for a while, it will absorb all of the telepathic input of the parents, of the society. And as it locks into that, it will pick up on belief systems from the parents, from society, and begin to incorporate those into its matrix as well. Oftentimes, both belief systems that are conducive to its thematic exploration and belief systems that are not necessarily conducive to its thematic exploration, except as belief systems that give the child an opportunity to later <clears throat> determine that it has a comparison to make between belief systems picked up from others that don't belong to it and what belief systems it would prefer. Again, all the absorption serves a purpose, but some of the belief systems may not necessarily ultimately be conducive to what that personality's choices are, but it is still part of the theme of exploration to have picked up those belief systems from your parents and from your society in order to later decide more clearly based on your comparison of self to those belief systems who you are and who you are not, because that's a part of the experience generally that you explore in physical reality to define yourselves and to go from the idea of limitation to less limitation, to go from the idea of forgetting to remembering, to go from the idea of pulling yourself together as a holistic being, having gone through the idea of separation and segregation within your consciousness. <clears throat> so it all serves a purpose, <clears throat> even though you will divest yourself of certain belief systems as you grow, they still served a purpose of being there because they gave you something to compare the ideal self against and gave you a measure of where you're going. So in that context, all of your parents have served you, even though they may not have known how they were doing it or what they were doing, even though they might have been if within their own integrity, more capable of expressing the idea of love to you in a more positive way. Nevertheless, <clears throat> because they may have had their own fears, their own doubts, their own issues of exploration that may never have been resolved for them, they still handed down to you those things that still give you the opportunity to decide more concretely who you are, even if only by recognizing through what they have given you who you are not. So it still serves all of you in that way if you are willing to use it that way. <clears throat> now, this brings us to the idea <clears throat> of the personality structure, the physical mind, and its relationship to higher self. Let us now rewind this, <clears throat> go back a little bit to where you first were forming from spirit that template reality. <clears throat> Aside from the mechanism we have now described of forming the physical side of the personality, the physical side of the person you will be in physical reality experience, at the same time, when you lay out that template, you also, from spirit, create a duality 
you create not only the physical side, the physical mind, but you create the template called the higher mind that goes specifically with that person. So every person is a person in totality when they express the idea of physical mind and higher mind. That is what makes you a whole person capable of exploring the idea of physical reality. Above that level, what you might call soul or spirit, it isn't broken out in that way. It is mostly the experience of what you would simply call higher mind, but it is not the same exact experience of higher mind, not the higher mind template that is formed to go hand in hand with the physical persona. But the higher mind template that is formed by the spirit acts as the liaison between the physical mind and the higher levels of your own soul. And so it remains to a great degree in the template level reality. Again, it is. <clears throat> by analogy, the individual still standing on the boat helping the diver who has gone down below making sure that they are given every support that they need, <clears throat> making sure they are still in communication, and helping to guide them from the surface in any way that they can by taking readings of what's going on around them and helping them in their exploration down below. <clears throat> so higher mind stays on the boat, physical mind goes deep sea diving. Now, once this relationship is established, then the idea is to get these two to work in concert, to get the physical mind and the higher mind to work in concert. Now, because your view <clears throat> deep, deep, deep under the ocean is limited, as it is when you go as a spirit deep, deep, deep into physical reality, the idea is to rely on the higher mind, the person on the boat, to be able to guide you to the horizon because they can see farther than you can. The deeper you go in the ocean, the darker it gets, the murkier it gets, the less visibility you have. <clears throat> the deeper you go into physical reality, the more limited your point of view can be. But you can always rely on the fact that the higher mind still up there on the surface on the boat can see clearly to the horizon and can, with the proper communication, guide the diver in the proper direction. So the idea then is to recognize that because you will experience a kind of disconnection from the surface, disconnection from the higher realm, <clears throat> it is important to rely on the communications of the higher mind for guidance. However, the paradox is, is that very often, <clears throat> not so much that it has to be this way anymore in your reality, but especially in your history, Diving deeply into physical reality has created the kind of disconnection and the kind of forgetfulness and the kind of limitation that allows you to not even remember you have had a higher mind. <clears throat> and therefore, you have created within yourselves, <clears throat> nevertheless, as part of your template, an urging, an urging within <clears throat> the physical persona to seek the higher mind. Because the higher mind knows, and the spirit knew when it formed the template, that it was highly likely the physical persona might get lost in the darkness. So it always gave the physical persona that one seed, that one spark, that urge to go toward the idea of the light, to go toward the idea of the higher mind, and to form that reconnection. This is expressed as the creative desire, the desire for love. That is what that is. The feeling of desiring love, the feeling of love, the desire to express oneself fully, creatively, in that sense, is different ways of expressing, of experiencing the seed that is created in the template that urges you back in that direction, <clears throat> urges you to reconnect with the higher self. Now, again, because of the degree of disconnection experience and the degree of forgetfulness that exists in the idea of physical reality, <clears throat> we understand that even that can sometimes be distorted, be clouded, be filtered. Nevertheless, the urge is there. It is always driving you <clears throat> to look for that which allows you to feel complete. 
And in many ways, when many of you are looking for things to allow you to feel complete, that's actually what you're looking for. You're looking for your connection to the higher mind, to reconnect, to form that relationship with the higher mind. We understand that many of you may, because of the forgetfulness, because of the filtration, because of the disconnection, because of the distortion, you may interpret the idea of that which you need for completion in a variety of different ways. Some individuals will feel that desire for completion by expressing it through the need for another person or the need for sustaining oneself with food or many other things. This idea, however, is all predicated on the notion that what you're actually looking for is that reconnection to the higher self. This is not to say it cannot be expressed in a number of ways or that those things cannot to some degree represent part of the path of reclaiming that connection. But very often, because of the forgetfulness, the physical mind and the ego structure may assume, may assume that the thing that in some sense is on one level representative of that reconnection is the reconnection itself, and it is all that is needed for the reconnection, and it often stops you short of making the reconnection because then you become fixated on the symbol of the reconnection rather than the reconnection itself. Now, the idea of the ego structure is basically this. It is simply for the purpose, it's really only job is simply for the purpose of keeping you focused as a physical personality in your physical reality experience. That's its job. It's just to focus you in physical reality. Ego, in a sense, is like the diving mask that gives you the ability to have a clear view underwater so that things are not too murky, so that you can see, sort of, at least to some degree, what is ahead of you, where you are going. It brings things of the physical reality into focus so that you can concentrate on them, so you can focus on them, so you can have a physical reality experience. It creates the idea and reinforces the idea of the belief systems that are part and parcel of the template of your consciousness, of your personality structure that you have created, reinforces them so that those beliefs can be experienced as fully as possible. That's why every single belief is self-reinforcing. Because the ego's job is to add energy to it, add focus to that belief to make it seem as if no other belief is possible. In order for you to focus on the belief strongly enough to actually have the physicalized manifestation and the experience that goes hand in hand with that particular belief you are holding to be true at any given moment. So the ego's job is to amplify those beliefs, to keep you focused in physical reality, to keep you focused in that experience. But when there is a degree of forgetting that exists to the extent that it has in your reality, very often, because of that sense of disconnection, because of that experience of disconnection, not that you're ever really disconnected, because you cannot be, but you can create the experience of disconnection to such a degree that the physical personality structure, the ego structure, can forget that it's not actually the one in charge, can forget that it has a helpmate in the template reality called the higher mind, can forget that it is not doing this alone. And in suddenly finding itself in the experience of being alone, it starts to build up the idea of fear. It starts to reinforce belief systems in a way that perpetuates its existence beyond the necessary level that it is actually required to generate for its continued existence. It starts to think that if it is all there is, then it's in charge of everything. The burden and the weight of the world is on its shoulders. The responsibility for everything that happens in your physical reality is up to the ego structure, and it starts to take on that job when it is not built for that job. It starts to burden itself, stress itself, And in that way, it starts to break down. It starts to do wildly 
incongruous, wildly irrational things to strengthen itself, strengthen itself, and strengthen itself under the feeling that it is crumbling under the weight. And by constantly reinforcing and strengthening itself in a way it was not designed to do, it can become extremely dense, extremely crystallized, and very difficult then to allow to expand back out into its more relaxed state, its more relaxed focus. And when it gets that concentrated, the amount of energy the ego puts into belief systems that are generally fear-based are going to be almost overwhelming. Because it is taking on this burden from a perspective of fear, most of its energy, most of its reinforcement is going to be fear-based. It's going to choose those things that are based on survival mode. It's going to reinforce itself with the idea that it must survive at all costs at this concentrated level. Otherwise, your life will end. It will be annihilated. The personality will dissolve. So the ego structure does everything it can to take on this tremendous burden. Let's all give the poor little ego a break. (laughs) Before the ego breaks down. Therefore, in this day and age, even in that concentration of ego physical personality structure, even in that degree of density, Look, you have still, still felt that little seed, that little urge that calls you back to the higher self, back to that frequency, back to the light. Even from that deep degree of murky darkness, you still were capable of sensing somewhere that there must be some kind of higher vibration that calls to you, that tugs at you, that pulls at your heart that allows you to feel, to know there is some level of reality wherein the ego is free, the personality is free to be what it was designed originally to be, and that there is no need for the stress and strife and struggle and dire consequences and dire experiences that the ego has for thousands of years on your planet sought to perpetuate in generation after generation after generation, constantly be reinforced and reinforced from generation to generation to generation. Now is the timing that you have finally gotten to the point where the light is bright enough, where enough of you are seeking that light within yourselves, that you are adding that to the collective reality and giving each other better opportunities with your collective momentum to know that there is a level of reality, a level of yourselves, a level of your whole being that is more than capable of reconnecting with you, that you deserve to reconnect with and deserve to lighten your load, to lighten up on yourself take the load off, drop the baggage, and get on your way through life in an easy and effortless creative manner. And this is the time and the age on your planet where you're now realizing that. So congratulations. (laughs) Now, we will share something with you to further strengthen the idea of the many different ways that you are starting to attract yourselves back to your own higher minds. So we will now share a little secret with all of you that we have shared with a few, and it is this. In these conversations that you are having with us, whether they be in this group structure or in one-to-one scenarios, doesn't matter. When you are speaking with us, you are actually speaking with your own higher mind. You are not speaking directly with us at all, ever. What we have done to aid and assist you by your invitation is we have wrapped the flavor of our personality like a shell around the core of your own higher self. And in every conversation we have with you, what we are doing thus then is giving you an excuse to talk to your own higher mind by tricking you into thinking you're talking to something else. Because that something else was one step removed from your own higher mind. In that context, wasn't as scary to the ego 
as thinking that you're actually addressing your own higher mind and all that that implies in terms of what you now have to take responsibility for. Therefore, the idea was, is that if you could find some vibration, some representation of a being that at least would represent that level, but was still one step removed, then it wouldn't be quite as scary and you could deal with it at your own pace in a comfortable way. Well, the idea here is that yes, while obviously we are involved, the actual communication you are having with us is actually the communication with your own higher minds, but wrapped in our vibrational flavor in order to allow you to use us as a permission slip to give yourselves permission to actually communicate with your own higher minds in a relaxed way and get your assumptions and your beliefs and your definitions and your ego structure out of the way so that you will allow yourself that communication. So congratulations on being so clever as to invite us to help you to trick yourselves into speaking to your higher minds. <laughs> Now, with this realization, <clears throat> then you can begin more and more every day in every way to relax the idea that there is fear attached to speaking and reconnecting to your own higher mind. The ego can now be taught that it will not die it will not be annihilated just because you are going to make a conscious reconnection to your higher mind. It will be given the opportunity to just do its job in a relaxed, creative, and loving way. <clears throat> it will be given its proper place in the idea of that whole person structure. It will be allowed to simply perform as it was designed to perform. It will not be overburdened with tasks and jobs that do not belong to it, and not only do not belong to it, but for which it is not designed, not capable of actually carrying out. <clears throat> As we have said previously in other transmissions, physical personality is not designed, is not capable, literally not designed, to know how something is going to happen. It's not designed to read the giant template where the higher mind resides. It is only designed to know how something is happening or has happened in physical reality. So the idea is that when the ego forgot that it was connected to the higher mind, it thought it needed to take on the duty, the job description of the higher mind, of trying to figure out how everything is going to happen. Well, this is my dream, this is my desire, now how am I gonna make that happen? I don't know, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna struggle, I'm gonna pull a little at this, I'm gonna grab at straws, I'm gonna reach out, flail out, flail around till I can figure out how to make this work, how to force it to work, how to push everything together in the way that I want it to be. When in fact, it's simply the idea of allowing the higher mind to bring it to you in the way the higher mind knows is best for the whole person that you have chosen to be and best for the themes that you have chosen to explore. Only the higher mind knows how it is best for that to happen because only the higher mind can see all the way to the horizon, can see the full path ahead, knows where all the twists and turns are, and thus knows what is actually the quickest route <clears throat> to the manifestation of your dreams. But when the physical ego thinks that it knows the best route, it will constantly be slamming into walls, bouncing off of rocks, banging its head into walls and all sorts of things because it believes that it knows and it is the only thing that knows and it will insist on going certain ways that it has been taught to believe is the quickest path to its dreams and desires, but which very often is actually the longest route. So instead of going around these things, around the things that it defines as obstacles, it will stand in front of them and constantly bash itself against these obstacles instead of listening to the higher mind that tells it that even though it may seem to take a little longer to go around, it's actually the quickest route because by going around, you will go that much more quickly than the time it will take for you to stand there and smash your head against the wall until you finally figure out you're not going to go through it. <clears throat> So the idea, again, is to recognize that physical mind does not have, does not have the capacity to know how something's going to happen. Let that be the job of the higher mind. 
just allow the physical mind to enjoy what it is brought, to see how it happened, to marvel at the synchronicity of how the higher mind was capable of organizing events so that it would serve the idea of the theme you chose to explore in the most loving, creative, beneficial, joyful way possible, most playful way possible. You must learn that the physical mind and the higher mind need to work together in order to be the whole person. Because if, in that sense, you are only using your physical personality, your physical mind, in an attempt to figure out how everything is supposed to work, you are literally walking through life half-witted. You're only using half of your full mind. So the idea is to understand that you really don't have a whole mind until you form a reconnection and a relationship and a communication style with the higher mind that allows you free-flowing trust, free-flowing communication in that relationship of functioning like a whole being. Now, imagination has been given as part of the personality structure to allow it to understand that it always has access to the higher mind. Imagination is the conduit, the pipeline to the higher mind and from the higher mind. But again, when the ego structure becomes so crystallized, so densified that it thinks it's the one in charge and has to figure every single little thing out, It will not trust the imagination. It will shut the door to the imagination because it seems unreal, superfluous, having nothing to do with what the ego has determined are the necessary things it must do to get where the person wants to go. So it will close and constrict that pipeline and it will not trust the imagination because it seems like the imagination is irrelevant, has nothing at all to do with what the ego has determined are the necessary steps. But what it has done by doing that is it has constricted the flow of communication coming from the higher mind that is actually the kind of information the physical personality needs in order to actually relax itself and move on through life in an effortless way. The idea, the idea, again, is to understand that once you form a relationship with the higher mind, once you form a balanced relationship with it, Imagination is the conduit through which inspiration will come and in which you will allow the physical personality to know that it is in constant communication with the person up on the boat and that it will never be guided into a crevasse. It will never be guided into the mouth of a shark. It will always be guided straight toward the horizon that represents the dream and the theme that the personality chose to explore. And all the transitions can happen quite magically when those lines of communication are open. Again, we remind you of this. Very often, the ego might be willing to use the imagination a little bit, but again, it often subverts the use of the imagination for its own purposes, to reinforce its own ideas of what it thinks is the best way to allow something to manifest. The physical personality may be willing from time to time to create a vision, an ideal vision of the dream. It will create all the scenarios. You have heard us say, and you've heard many say, visualize, 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 create a mock-up in your mind's eye, in your imagination, of the ideal scenario that represents to you the idea of your highest excitement, your highest passion. And this is a good thing to do. This is a positive thing to do. It is a beneficial and creative thing to do, to use your imagination and visualize what is a representation, the closest possible representation you can create with your physical mind of that ideal scenario that you say is representative of your passion, of your dream. But here is the key. It is only a representation. Now, this is not to say that what you imagine at that moment cannot come to pass exactly as you have imagined it. Oftentimes, it happens exactly that way, and that is all well and good. But the only reason it may have happened that way is you actually allowed a momentary opening and actually recognized what the higher mind was telling you was the representation of the best way for you. Nevertheless, here is where many individuals on your planet fall into the trap. 
again, because of the ego structure's predilection for thinking, it has to figure everything out and know how everything is going to happen. <clears throat> when the ego structure may make a vision <clears throat> that is representative of the ideal reality, what the ego tends to think, because it thinks of itself as the highest possible authority for your person, it tends to think that that vision it has created by using imagination in that way to paint that picture in your mind, it thinks that that's the highest possible way in which that reality could manifest. But from the higher mind's point of view, that picture that to the ego seems like the highest possible manifestational form is actually the lowest possible manifestational form. What to the physical ego is the ceiling to the higher mind is the floor. It can go much higher than that. And in fact, it can actually go so high, so far, it can actually be beyond physical mind's capability of imagining how it could occur. That's why, that's why you do not need to insist the physical mind and the ego does not need to insist that the picture it conjures up as a representation of the ideal scenario must be the exact way that it must manifest, otherwise something has failed, something has gone wrong. It is just used as a template to pass on to the higher mind the basic idea that represents, pay attention, the proper vibrational state of being that the physical being needs to experience in life. <clears throat> in order to perpetuate its joy. The higher mind will take that template, take that representation, because after all, it exists in a template reality. It understands template language very well. That's its native tongue. Template symbols are its native tongue. It understands symbols very well. It will take that symbol and recognize that that symbol simply represents the proper state of being, the proper energy that needs to be created. And so the higher mind will then take that symbol and it will reach out to all the things it understands are available, all of the how can this happen sort of thing, and it will match those things to the proper template frequency and then bring that <clears throat> into the reality, the opportunities for the physical mind to act upon. But when the physical mind hesitates to act on the synchronicities that are brought to it because the ego says, I don't recognize that as the template I set up and doesn't trust that the higher mind could have actually brought it the opportunity it wants in a different form other than what the ego determined it should be, it will refuse to act on those things. It will refuse to recognize those as opportunities. Those opportunities coming from the higher mind will even be invisible to the physical mind. It just simply won't even know they are even there to be acted upon. And therefore it will miss those doorways and will never walk through them and will never see the manifestation of its desires because it has been too insistent on the how and not allowed the higher mind to actually show the physical mind the true how because the higher mind can actually imagine ways far beyond the physical mind's imagining of how such a thing could occur. So, all well and good to set up the parameter of a visualization for the physical mind, but don't insist it must manifest that way because the higher mind might be capable of bringing it to you far greater than you ever imagined. Let it, let it, let it. At least, that's our suggestion. <clears throat> it's up to you. So, now, many individuals have wondered, well, if the physical ego thinks it's in charge, <clears throat> and attempts to shut out all other forms of communication because it doesn't trust them, coming from the higher mind, how do I know the difference between when the physical mind is telling me, oh, this is representative of your excitement, and when the higher mind is telling me, this is representative of your true excitement? How can I tell the difference? Because if the ego is attempting to trick me into staying its course, because it thinks if I veer off that we're gonna die, <clears throat> it's going to, dangle all sorts of carrots in front of me to get me to stay on that course. So how do I tell the difference between that kind of a carrot and the carrot that represents going in the direction of my true self? All right, <clears throat> fair question. It all comes down to what we have spoken of so often. It all comes down to excitement. It all comes down to passion. But again, we hear the ego saying, how can I tell the difference? How do I know it's really my true excitement? <clears throat> now. This requires paying some attention to yourself. 
really paying attention to the true feelings. It does require at least a modicum of willingness, a modicum of willingness to tell the ego to shut the hell up. (laughs) At least just for a moment so that I can hear my true self at least take a breath, at least take a pause, at least stop and wonder whether or not you are actually being shown something that is representative of a fear or something that is representative of a joy. Because we understand that when you're in that confused state, anxiety can actually seem like excitement. And excitement can actually seem like anxiety. But this is why it's so critical to take that pause, to allow yourself to at least be in charge enough, be willing enough to tell the ego to be quiet for a moment so that you can get in touch with your inner being and tell the difference in the quality of the vibration of the emotion you are feeling at that moment with respect to the idea you are exploring. If you are quiet for that moment and willing to be open to be shown what it actually is, you will be able to tell the difference. You'll be able to develop the discernment of the difference between the vibration of fear and doubt and the vibration of joy and certainty. You will be able to tell the difference because that ability to tell the difference is built into you. It's built into your consciousness. And at that level, you all know the difference. But if the ego is making too much noise, if it's not allowing you to stop and think, it does that specifically to prevent you from being able to tell the difference because it's afraid that if you tell the difference, it won't be in charge anymore. And to the ego, that means death because it doesn't believe the higher self really exists. So... It's all about finding that space of balance and peace within yourself that will allow you, even if only just for a moment, to allow the ego to be quiet enough so that you can use the natural mechanism of balance within your being that will tell you what the flavor of the emotion you're feeling is. And thus, by identifying the flavor of the emotion, that will then put you in touch with what kind of belief and definition you would have to have in order to be generating that emotion. And then you will know whether it comes from the physical negative ego or from the higher self, whether it is representative of fear, whether it is representative of excitement. But you need that moment of quietude. You need that moment of solitude. You need that moment of peace. You have to be willing to step back You have to be willing to let it be all right to not know what's going on at the moment. You have to be willing to say, I don't know what's happening here, instead of just assuming it's this or that or the other thing. So anytime you find yourself in doubt about what you're experiencing, take that moment and say, I don't know what's happening and that's okay. And in that moment where you have actually admitted that you don't know what's going on, you can find the balance, the quiet, the peace, the stillness that will actually then start to allow you to be more sensitive to the quality of the vibration of what's going on and give you more capability of having more insight as to what you are experiencing and what you are dealing with in terms of the physical mind or the higher mind. So that's the first step in forming the relationship, in reconnecting, in remembering who you are as a whole person. That's the first step is just taking a moment of quiet, of pause, of stepping back into a neutral place and letting it be all right to not know what the answer is. As soon as you allow yourself to be all right in that balance point, 
You can allow the natural senses you were created with to begin to fill that stillness, to fill that little void of quietness, and they will begin to be heard. But you have to be quiet to hear them at first because they have been suppressed for so long in your society that at first it will only seem like a whisper, but you'll recognize it. In the quiet, if you truly allow the quiet to happen, there will be no other sound, and thus you'll be able to recognize the quality of those little whispered voices for what they are. And as soon as you really start paying attention to what they are, you can start to guide yourself with them in the direction of your preference. And as you do that, bit by bit, and this may take some practice, it's all right. Bit by bit, you will start to gain more discernment as to exactly what vibration is representative of what, and you will start to pacify the ego into understanding that it's not going to die, it's not going to be annihilated, that in fact this is what it really wants because it is tired of laboring under such stressful circumstances, it is tired of bearing the weight and you're going to take the load off and you're going to bring it along. It's not going to go anywhere, it is your friend, you love it, it is serving you, it is designed for a purpose of focusing you in the physical reality experience you wanted to have in the theme you wanted to explore and you cannot live without it literally you cannot live without it so in that sense while you are forming a more loving relationship with your higher mind the key to forming a more loving relationship with your higher mind is to actually form a more loving relationship with your ego and not allow it to continue to burden itself unbearably when it has no business doing so because it was never designed to handle that kind of weight, that kind of stress. So it's all about loving all aspects of yourself enough to be trusting enough to let them fall back into their proper place in the relationship, do the job they were designed to do, and thus then allow yourself to be loving enough to yourself to reap the benefit of that balanced uh, relationship between physical mind and higher mind so you can function as a whole person. Does this make sense? Yes. Yes. All right. Having said that, We may now, if you wish, open to questions and exchanges. We have a question from our listeners at News for the Soul. All right. Um, So um, I thought You may get the ball rolling. Okay. Um, I guess this question dovetails exactly with what you're talking about, which is, um, I was thinking of a... One moment. Shh. Remember we just spoke about quietness? Thank you. Um, I was thinking about following your excitement and how the ego can be helpful or um, obstructive in allowing you to follow your excitement. So let's say a person wants to try a new endeavor, which might involve quitting their job and following their passion that way. But they have a lot of anxiety about the financial consequences of that. Yes. And so how does this happen that the person is able to balance out the energy between their higher mind and their physical mind um, in order to be able to have everybody do their job appropriately in that scenario. First and foremost, as we have said, you must honor the belief system that is there to whatever capacity you feel it is necessary to do so. In other words, you give honor to the belief system that the ego has created and recognize that from the ego's perspective, it is valid. From the physical mind's perspective, it is valid. Therefore, you don't abandon it willy-nilly, as you say. You work with it. You, in a sense, make a deal. You say, all right, I'll tell you what, physical mind, ego mind, I'll tell you what. I will continue to work with, oh, say, 90% of that belief system, but give me just 10% to play around with, and I will show you that that 10% can actually work. Make a deal, strike a deal with the ego to give you some latitude to move beyond even a little bit incrementally beyond the belief system you believe is necessary in order for you to continue. 
As you make those deals and keep doing them, bit by bit, you will train the ego to understand that as you ask for more and more latitude, the ego will actually feel itself being more and more supported, and it will allow you more and more and more latitude until such time as one day <clears throat> you will look around and realize that all the old belief systems are already gone and that you allow yourself complete support with the new belief systems in whatever way actually supports you. The second thing is while you're doing that and making those kinds of deals with the ego, if that's what it takes, is to embark on an expedition, embark on a campaign <clears throat> of redefining the ideas that you're using. For example, the idea that the only way you can be supported in life, the only way you can be allowed to do the things that you desire to do is with one particular format or representation of abundance. Remember that our definition of abundance is the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it. Period. Now, if on your planet money is one of those things, all well and good. <clears throat> but the idea is it's simply required that you have the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it. And if money isn't necessarily the way in which it's best to do that thing, then your reality, your higher mind will actually bring you the thing that would actually allow you to do that with less effort. Because sometimes if you insist that money's the only way a certain thing can be accomplished, again, that might simply be setting up an obstacle to bang your head against when in fact your higher mind could actually bring it to you in a more easy way if you would only relax your definitions about what you think you need. So by Going on a campaign of changing your definitions of what you think you need in order to be who you prefer to be and have the life you prefer, <clears throat> while simultaneously making deals with your ego to let you stretch a little bit beyond the belief systems, but while still honoring those you really feel you cannot yet change, you can work out a pacing for yourself that will allow everyone the balance they need, everyone to participate, all the aspects of your consciousness to participate as it needs to, and bit by bit, you will find that you will change. So if the ego is frightened in that <clears throat> scenario, <clears throat> yes. will it sometimes try to sabotage the person? Like they'll say, yes, of okay, course. I'm gonna try but this. But that's why you need to strike a deal. You see, you need to find a negotiation that works. Because the only time that the negative ego will sabotage you if it feels it's not gotten a fair listen, a fair deal, a fair negotiation. If it feels that you are avoiding it, <clears throat> attempting to go around it, circumvent it. You understand? It sounds like so a business deal. It protocol. is a business deal. <laughs> because the physical ego is all about physical business, the physical world. Therefore, one good way is to use its own language. Deal with it in a negotiation and allow it to understand that you are willing to negotiate fairly. So if you negotiate a fair deal from the ego's point of view and it allows you some latitude in that negotiation, then there is no reason why it would need to sabotage you. The sabotage only comes when you have not negotiated a fair deal. That sounds incredible because it's really about understanding the language of the ego yes. and talking in terms that it really can embrace yes. and accept. Absolutely. It's all about definitions, understanding them, and working with them. So just to be clear, which part is making the deal with the ego? Very good question because you see that's where the cleverness comes in. Because the idea is that the one that is actually negotiating with the ego is the higher mind. And so by bringing up the issue of creating a fair negotiation, you have already brought the higher mind to the table. And it starts negotiating with the physical mind in a fair manner. Because higher mind is all about balance and fairness but you're using the physical mind's language in order to get the idea across. So both are present in the negotiation. That's the issue. Both are present at the table. By even offering the idea of a negotiation, you have brought both the physical mind and the higher mind to the table to work out the best deal for the whole person. And that's the underlying issue in the negotiation. You are working out a fair deal for everything involved.
for the whole being, for both sides, for both polarities. All right? Okay, that's great. I, I'm getting a lot more clear on how you can have this dialogue with all these different aspects of yourself yes. and become a unified person. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bashar. Thank you. Good day, Bashar. And to you, good day. Thank you. Um, recently in, uh, in my meditations, especially with the use of entheogens, uh, I have... The uh, use of? Entheogens. Define. Uh, well, the scientific name for it, entheogen, N meaning in, theo is God, gen is generate, so it's plants that generate God within, such as like mushrooms and things of those Understood. nature. Understood. Okay, so um, I've, I've, uh, I've done mudras. Yes. Um, and later finding out my you know, ego, physical mind, doing research, uh, finding out their ancient Tibetan hand signals that raise frequency. Yes. Um, what is it? Is this my higher mind communicating with me? What, why is this happening? Is it like a quantum overlap? What's, uh, well, what's yes, going on? Well, yes, in a sense, although again, remember that all of these things are simply permission slips. You understand? Sort of. Can you elaborate? The notion of permission slips is simply that which you are attracted to use as a symbolic helpmate to put yourself in the proper state of being that represents more of your true self. But the idea is that you attract yourself to use these tools, these rituals, these ideas as a permission slip to align with your belief system, to allow yourself a reason to give yourself permission to be more of yourself. None of these things themselves are actually doing this. You are. But they are designed by nature to function as permission slips to allow you to give yourself permission to unlock those states of beings within you. And the ultimate realization that comes from the use of permission slips is that you no longer need them to create the state. Are, are you referring to the entheogen or the All mudras? Of it. All Any of it. it. Any tool, any technique, any physical symbol that allows you to feel that you can achieve a certain state of being, a certain vibratory level, is nothing but a permission slip that ultimately will show you that you no longer need the permission slip to create that state. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I just, I, I'm just, I guess I'm a little bit more uh, questioning, like when this is happening also, I guess you could say like Reiki type healing yes. occurs as well. Yes, um, but again, all healing is done by simply creating a vibration that suggests to the person to be healed what frequency they need to match within themselves in order to create the experience of healing for themselves. I understand that. Um, and also, just real quick, um, the ego itself uh, yes. in an out-of-body experience type Just the situation. fundamental ego, you mean? Uh, just the focusing mechanism? Yes. Yes. The, the inner dialogue, I yes. guess. Yes. Um, in an inner, out of body experience type situation, yes. um, where you feel totally dissolved and one with everything. Well, not exactly, but go ahead. Not exactly. Well, in other words, if you actually had the so called experience, I put that in your quotes, of actually being the one, you would not actually have an experience. You would just be the one. The one does not experience itself. The only way that the one could experience itself was by creating itself as the all. So when you have the experience you just talked about, the actual experience you're having is a connection to the all within the one, but it is not actually a connection as the one itself. It is only a connection to the one as the all. Is that like the 99% kind of uh, method you gave yesterday, like right before the it one? It is similar to that idea, yes. Because to actually go into the one, to actually be the one, there is nothing else. And an experience cannot be had when there is nothing to compare yourself to. So the one has no experience. It has experience as the all that it is, but not as the one. So... This is just a clarification of terminology. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So, in your out-of-body experiences, when you can perceive a connection to the all, that the one is, yes? Yes. And then, you were going to say beyond that? Oh, I was just going to say beyond that, uh, just when, when you experience that, like... Uh, 
it's it's more of a processing thing coming back into the ego mind. Like I was going to ask with that yeah. question, uh, is there really a, a dissolution of the ego or is it still there? You still have a sense of your own identity, but it is not actually experienced in the same methodology or by the same mechanism as the physiological mind's ego structure. Is that similar to dreams then? It is more similar to that, but it is actually even beyond that. Because the dream itself also has to be a physical mind construct in order for the physical mind to understand the symbologies of the experience. The dream may not be literally representative of the experience you had, but it may be the closest approximation the physical mind can make to symbolize and represent that an experience was had. Therefore, the dream structure is actually a creation of the physical mind personality. Okay, so that's not the higher mind then sending, like, for example, for uh, inspiration, imagination that comes from the higher mind. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It can be that the origination of the information comes from the higher mind. What we are saying is that in order for the physical mind to understand it, it has to cloak it in symbology that makes sense to the physical mind. Okay. Therefore, what it's actually perceiving are an arrangement of its own symbols of what the higher mind is saying. It's like translating from one language to another. Excellent. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good day, Bashar. And a you good day. Uh, thank you very much for tricking me into talking to my higher mind. You are very welcome. Because uh, mm -hmm. that's what I've been wanting. Yes. So I do spend time every day being quiet in meditation. All right. Trying to get my ego mind to shut up. Oh, all right. Okay, that only works so well. Well, this it's is all... where the negotiation comes in. Okay, so speak a little bit more about that. Well, so, again, the idea is to know that when you propose a negotiation... <clears throat> that you are proposing something that is fair for everyone, including the ego structure, including the physical mind, including the higher mind, that something can be worked out that will work for all. Now, we understand that there may be a belief system within the physical personality structure that may not trust that, and you may have to work with that a little bit. But that is why we say if you honor, if in the negotiation you promise to honor the belief systems that are already there that come from the physical mind's fear-based belief, then by honoring it as much as is necessary, then you can prove over time that it is no longer necessary to hold those things to be as true. So you does have to start, in a sense, with giving the physical personality, in a sense, let's say, you have to give it the first win in the negotiation. You follow me? Okay. By honoring the belief systems it has created, by validating them and recognizing that from the physical mind's point of view, they are valid. It's only trying to protect you after all. It's protecting itself, but it's protecting you. Yeah. Because it thinks itself is you. Yes. So the idea is that what it's doing, no matter how detrimental it may seem, no matter from what negative place it may seem to come, it's doing it out of love. Making the statement in your negotiation, your opening statement in your negotiation that you recognize that it's doing what it's doing out of love is the way to begin the negotiation. And then what you're returning with is the idea that what you are also proposing is out of love because you want the ego to survive and you want it to experience joy in doing its job effortlessly. And therefore, what you're going to propose is a sensibly and reasonably paced unfolding of a change in a negotiation that honors its side, its view, while at the same time also allowing you to prove to it that the changes you are proposing will serve it as well. So it's a win-win situation. But you must start any such negotiation by letting it, in a sense, win its first point because the ego is all about winning. Yes. When you can teach the ego then that you're interested in a win-win, it will start to relent and grant you some leeway. Then you can work with whatever it is it gives you. And even if you are given a seed, you can expand that and keep expanding that in your future negotiations as you prove bit by bit that the old beliefs are no longer necessary for the ego to continue to win. At a certain point, you will cross a threshold in those negotiations where the ego will actually be eager 
to grant you more and more and more leeway because it will actually start to feel the burden lighten up on itself. It will actually start to feel more like its true self. It will actually start to stretch out and say, you know, this isn't half bad. (laughs) Well, in fact, then maybe it is just half bad, (laughs) but it is working its way to being all good. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Does that help? Yes, it helps. And I think it may answer the second part, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Oh, all right. So then when I get the ego to be quiet for a while, then I spend the second part asking questions of my higher mind and then waiting for an answer and writing it down. You can. Again, remember, it is important during this point to actually use this quiet time to begin a dialogue with your higher mind in whatever way will allow the ego to feel that you're not tricking it. Give me an example. Do it. Well, again, you have to express the idea that you're going to... Are you familiar with the idea? Again, this comes back to the idea of what you call business language. Are you familiar with the idea of full disclosure? Yes. (laughs) Well, that's what you're doing with the ego. Okay. You're saying, all right, the first win goes to you. And now, if you will allow me... I'm going to talk a little bit with the higher mind. Is that all right? (laughs) Of course, the ego will think that you are something else talking to the higher mind when in fact the higher mind is actually saying that. Okay. You understand? Yes. All right. Because at first the ego won't recognize you as the higher mind. But when you get the ego to be quiet, you actually start talking to it as the higher mind. But for a while, you may have to pretend that you're not. You may have to pretend to seem to be a neutral party. Maybe you can even pretend you're the negotiator in between the physical (laughs) mind and the higher mind. The point here is to use your imagination to make that negotiation work in whatever way it seems to work best. But what is important is full disclosure so the ego doesn't feel it's being tricked. And when the ego doesn't feel it's being tricked, the ego will have no reason to trick and sabotage you. So full disclosure is important. All the lessons of what you call win-win business negotiation are applicable to negotiating with the ego structure. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bashar, I am absolutely excited and delighted to be here with you. Oh, all right. Thank Thank you you so much. And good day. Good day to you. Good day. I have been asking my ego to allow me to exponentially move forward away from what I recognize as limiting belief systems. And how has it responded? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's going pretty well. I have big dreams, but they feel surrounded by limitations. I get what happens is I get very close to the people and experiences that could, you know, that might be the ushering me in towards them. And then something (coughs) recoils and I end up sort of in a cross between dire circumstances and debt and this possibility of amazing things. That's because you have set up the negotiation to allow the ego to toy with you. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a mean ego that I've got. All right. I'm working well, on it. Again, the idea <laughs> is to go back to the zero point. Renegotiate the deal. Okay. Don't be so insistent on having a particular kind of expansion. Even the idea of an exponentially expansive, joyful life may not even be involved in the first negotiation. You may not want to enter that arena in the first negotiation. You may just want to start with just a little bit. But if survival issues are up, that does begin to play into it. But what we are saying is that if you propose a less aggressive agenda to the ego, it will not feel threatened and survival issues won't arise. Right. You see, you may have proposed too much for the ego to handle. You may have said, I want it all or nothing. I want to explode, expand at an exponential rate. And the ego's going, okay. We'll see how far you get. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, there she goes. Oh, yes, expanding, expanding, expanding. Yank. <laughs> Yank you right back. Because you didn't deal with the actual underlying reasons why the ego would feel the need to do that. So essentially, it's still an issue of not being gentle enough with the ego to, feel, to let it feel it's included in the bargain. Not being gentle enough and then therefore not being, shall we say, <clears throat> precise enough 
in your investigation of what the underlying beliefs and definitions were that are creating the ego to be in the state that it's in, not understanding the ego clearly enough and why it is holding the position in the negotiation that it is. Uh, When okay. you understand the ego's motivations, then you can deal with them in the negotiation. You cannot just bargain and run and not understand where the other side is coming from. Otherwise, they'll pull the plug. I hear you, uh, but I'm trying as hard as I can. <clears throat> so no, don't perhaps... try so hard. Okay. Why are you trying so hard? Are you in a hurry to get where you want to go? What kind of energy do you think that puts into a negotiation? Oh, well, you don't really want to be here talking to me. You want to be off having fun in some other place and leave me behind. I don't believe you're sincere in this negotiation, the ego says. You're in too much of a hurry to get where you think you need to go. You're not cherishing my value. You're not staying in the moment, in the present, as if this was the most important thing in your life. I feel unloved and abandoned. <clears throat> Aww. And okay. I'm going to get you back for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Good You're job. being well mean done. to me, so I'm going to be just as mean to you. Right. Are I you get getting you. the point now? Yes, yes, I, I do. I do. I get it so completely. It's just that it's how just that to. What? I it's just, just told you, okay. you need to relax and not be so eager to get where you think you need to go. You need to be nowhere more important than right here, right now. Whatever is happening and whatever process is important to go through in forming this dialogue and this negotiation with your ego is the most important thing in your life and nothing and nowhere is more important to be. Forget about being anywhere else. This is the most exciting thing. <laughs> and if I end up on the street corner with, uh, you know, without a home? Oh, good way to set yourself up. <clears throat> well, it's heading there. Who is saying that? A ba some bastard, man. I'm going to go wrestle with him. The negative Excuse ego me. is saying that to try and scare you because you've scared it. Don't you understand? That's how it works. If you scare the negative ego, it will scare you back by making you believe. Remember what we said about negative ego reinforcing negative beliefs? Yes. So when you scare the negative ego by making it think you're going to abandon it, it will scare you into seeing a future that is one to avoid so you won't go away. It's covering the reality you could have with a smoke screen an illusion of a reality you don't want so you won't move in that direction because it doesn't want you to go because you've let it think you're abandoning it because you're not treating it with enough respect gotcha make sense yes sir oh thank S you ma sirs <laughs> thank you my dear and you as well my darling Good afternoon, Bashar. And are you good day? Long time no speak from my point of view. I do believe it's been 17 years since we spoke. Thank you for being oh, here. Oh, a mere few orbits around your sun. <laughs> friend, um, friend, I'd like to discuss a little bit further um, the ego issue regarding second-guessing internal dialogues with, yes. with spirit and, and the like. Now, um, over the years, we discussed when we first met uh, guides and the like and yes. certain things. How, as time's progressed... These communications are, do occur, but at, at some of the times, my self part of myself kicks in and says, oh, "It's not happening. It's not a reality. You're fantasizing. You're making yes. it up. You're yes. playing with yourself." Yes. So, uh, probably should have worded that better. Um, but uh, with regards to that, how how can you be? And I know 100% certain is an objective phrase, but how can you be certain that the dialogues you are having internally? aren't just um, made up. For example, yes. about 12 months ago, laying in bed with my, with my partner, etc., and I put out some thoughts to say hello, and it was either you or you in aspect yes. that dialogued with me, and it wasn't a dialogue, it was a dissertation with four topics, and I remember the last comment, you will remember this. Yes. So I'm articulating that back to you now yes. to establish whether that was you as an individual or whether that was you an aspect through my own consciousness dialoguing it with It was myself. your own higher self tapping into our frequency and delivering the information in our flavor. Okay. So in that then, how can I encourage those interactions By ongoingly? By not needing them to happen. 
So letting go of the requirement for them to have... Absolutely. All expectation needs to be let go of so that you can simply allow what needs to be there to be there. Okay. Paradoxically, by needing something to happen, you fill the space in which the thing can actually occur, and thus there's no room for it to occur. Okay. Okay. You fill that space with the need for it to happen. No longer having the need for it to happen empties the space, and what needs to happen will happen. So would that then be a corollary? I've been also putting out um, requests to the auditors, as it were, to interact with you in a dream state. Yes. I'm still waiting for the, for the circumstances for that to drop. Would that be sort of the similar thing? Is the, the uh, either the... Actually, what you're waiting to do is remember that it's already happened. Okay, then I'd, choose to, I'd like to remember that it's occurred. Because then go ahead. It, well, I don't, I, I'm uncertain of how to access that memory in this now. Don't need to. I've become, I've, that's sort of going in a circle for me, and I'm uncertain how to address that because I, if you're saying... The why truth, is it so important for you to access that memory? That's another way of asking you why you need it so much. Okay, because the only other time that we've interacted on that level was, um, was a hoot, and I enjoyed a it. A hoot? And I enjoyed it. Well, I could use other terms, but I'm... All right. But does that mean that other things in your life are not as much of a hoot? <laughs> well said, well said. Um... Perhaps when you add more hooting to your own life, (laughs) you will increase your vibration to the level on which more hooting will take place. Indeed, indeed. All right, um, I just wanted to cover off on those two issues regarding the the, the internal dialogues and how to be able to be certain within yourself that... Well, again, the first step is not to care one way or another whether you have to be so certain. Hmm. The idea, again, is to focus on the things that give you joy and just get on about the business of living your life to the best of your capacity in acting on the things that give you passion Mm. and trusting that whatever else you need to know, you will know, and whatever other experiences you need to have, you will have. Remember, you've made appointments, you've made agreements to have certain things happen in certain timing. And the only way, the only way you can miss those appointments is by worrying that you will miss those appointments. Touche. So, does that help? It does, brother. It does, brother. Um, thank All you. All right. Owl, see you later. Owl. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Good day, Bashar. And are you good day? All the way from New York, just for oh, one day. <laughs> all the way. All right. Um, have, uh, About that far on your planet from my perspective. <laughs> 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 Super excited to be here. Oh, all right. Um, I have a question in regards to um, ever since I started learning about your teachings, and uh, it became became av- evident to me that uh, we actually can learn so much just by being and paying attention to what's going on around us. Because yes. nature, our physical nature itself, is a tremendous teacher. Yes. And I think that's why you're bringing a lot of analogies in our physical lives. Same. Uh, analogy as a scuba diver, for example. Yes. And when you were talking about uh, our ego and our, our higher self having a conversation, it yes. came to me evident that we actually doing the, the same thing yes. with our children. Yes. On a daily basis. Yes. We're creating this bond and this trust that it all comes with love, and we just have to negotiate and create this uh, kind of a trust relationship with our children. Yes. And once they do that. Basically, I'm looking at my children right now like my ego in that analogy, basically. Once my children start to trust me enough, we create that bond, and they, that's where... Well, understand that your children actually already trust you implicitly. The idea is that they trusted you enough to be fed whatever it is you telepathically fed them about what you believe to be true. So the idea is to allow yourself and your duty as a parent to be clear that the idea that you love them is already clear, but the ideas of how you express the concept of love may need to be brought into alignment. I'm not saying this is the case, I'm just talking generalities. Mm -hmm. The idea is that children are completely implicitly trusting of the parent, and they receive whatever they receive from the parent as if it were the perfect symbol or representation of the parent's love. Now, if the parent is sending negative ego belief systems down that avenue toward the child, 
then the child will start to interpret negative belief system ego structures as a symbol of love and that will be the only symbol the child will know and the only symbol the child will themselves be able to express in life until they get a handle on how to bring that back into alignment with symbols that are more positively representative of the underlying current of unconditional love that is always there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. All right. Uh, going further, mm -hmm. I there's a definition that we talk about a lot, and, and you were talking about children being all the souls that are coming here as the teachers. Yes, especially now in this day and age, many of the children being born on your planet and that have been being born now for about the last 20 years or so are in a sense not only a new generation, they are actually a different species. And it is representative of souls that have a lot of experience in many of them that are cross-connecting to many different experiences in many different parallel realities. And by the genetic alteration that is happening within them as they restructure their embryonic bodies, they are creating a genetic structure that will give rise to a personality structure that will not forget as much of who they are as beings, as whole beings, as spirits. <clears throat> My question was, I'm trying to define for myself, is there such a thing as old soul, if we are eternal beings? Well, it's a us. euphemism. Old in this context means they have a certain kind of experience they are bringing to the reality they are interacting with. It's I not see. really a measure of time. It's a measure of the degree of certain kinds of experiences and knowledge they are bringing to share with any particular reality they might be interacting with. So they are more experienced in, experienced in the sense in this particular reality than yes. some other soul. They are more experienced in the kind of knowledge required by this particular reality in order to advance. That's what old soul means. I it's see. not really a measure of time. In the same way that we know many humans sometimes misinterpret the phrase uh, light year and think it's a measurement of time when in fact it's a measurement of distance. I see. You understand? I do. So, old in this sense is simply a euphemism. It doesn't mean old in terms of time. Does that help? Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you, Bashar. <coughs> Bashar, we have a question from one of our listeners. <coughs> All right. This one is, um, <coughs> Bashar, do you have an ego? We have a sufficient amount of ego to keep us focused in physical reality to whatever degree we wish to be focused in it. But again, we remind you, ego by itself is not a negative term. It's just a focusing mechanism. We do not, however, experience the idea of the negative ego. Do you experience the full range of emotions as humans do? We do not experience what you would call the emotions of fear. Sadness. We do not experience that. Um, anger. We do not experience that. Um, f frustration. We do not experience that. Um, uh, Go on. <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> uh, uh, elation. Absolutely. Um, do you give yourself a pat on the back when you do a good job? <laughs> The enjoyment of doing the job is enough because it is far more satisfying than any pat on the back could ever be. And we do not need to pat ourselves on the back because we know creation has our back. Oh. So when we have a more balanced ego structure, yes. how would a human experience themselves? As a joyful, playful child. Just experiencing themselves rather than thinking about themselves experiencing it. It's beautiful. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Bashar. And to you, good day. Okay, going on the line of um, your definition of abundance, yes. um, can you define need? Again, we understand that sometimes certain terms in your language may have different meanings. And we can understand that it can be confusing at times, especially when some of these concepts are attempting to be translated into linear space-time reality terminology, which may not be accurately representative of some of the concepts that are being sent, but may be close enough. 
need in the context of a positive frame of reference is simply that which is necessary for the continued support of a being. Need in the negative sense is that which the ego may think is required, but may in fact only be the idea of a reinforcement of negative attributes or negative beliefs to aggrandize the self and make the self seem more important. Okay, so knowing that, um, need being I know that I only really need you know, the, the very basics of food, and I know you've had a list from before of certain things. You have to sleep a certain amount, you have to dream a certain amount. Yes. There are those needs, but then, I mean, all those can be met without really experiencing much of a joyful life. Oh, they can be, but believe me, if you do them in the purest possible way, breathing is a joy, eating is a joy, sleeping is bliss. Okay, okay. So, yes, <laughs> and again, you can see there is a different bifurcation of the terminology and the different definitions and the subtleties of the definitions in the one word your language has expressed as the word need. Yes. So, yes, you can do them, in a sense, from a lower vibration. You can do the basics, the fundamentals, but if you only look at them, if you only define those basics as just getting by, then of course you will only experience them in a relatively flat sort of vibration. But if you understand that these basic needs are the very foundation of your ability to have the experience you are having, then they become joyful celebrations. They become things you are grateful for and give gratitude and appreciation to because they allow you to have the experience that is allowing you to discover more and more and more expansively who you really are. So they all play a part in letting you do that. In other words, you could say, well, the deep sea diver <clears throat> can sort of say, well, yes, I recognize the need for this breathing apparatus. That's all well and good. But when you are 50 feet below, believe me, without that breathing apparatus, suddenly you're very grateful for it <laughs> because it allows you to breathe in an environment that gives you an experience you otherwise could not have. You okay. understand? Yes, I do. Does that help? Yes, following that, um, for instance, um, I want, I don't think I need a hung, the musical instrument on the stage, the steel pan. Yes. I want one of those, but I don't actually, need one. Actually, you may find that in the positive context, you actually need one, and that wanting can actually be the negative context. Okay, yeah, so I don't know how to not judge the want of things. How about just allowing it to come to you? Okay. What about that device gets you so charged up, gets you so excited. I have a hard time putting in words, I think, I don't know. But it does excite you. Absolutely. You feel that vibration when you look at it, when you think of it, when you hear it, yes? Yes. You feel that connection, yes? Yes. <clears throat> then, that is, along with the vision of yourself playing it, that is the only language needed. The feeling and the picture of you playing it in the ideal scenario is the only language needed, the only symbol needed for you to then hand over to the higher self and then forget about it. Okay. Let it go. Trusting that the higher mind now knows what you truly vibrationally need and that it will then bring about the synchronicities and circumstances necessary for the manifestation of that, if, in fact, that is representative of the highest state. Or it might bring you something you couldn't even imagine that would actually allow you to experience more excitement and more joy than you're imagining in your scenario now. Either way, the point is, if you let that go and then continue to simply act at every given moment on whatever option is the most exciting option you have the ability to act on, you will then be trusting by those actions the higher self and it is leading you, you will trust that it is leading you through those connections, no matter how winding they may seem, no matter how much they may seem to have nothing to do with your original desire, you will trust that because the excitement is there in each of those acts, it is connected, and you will trust that your higher mind is luring you through those excitements to the idea of the manifestation of any symbol that represents your joy and excitement. Did that make sense? Perfect sense, yes. 
my when I was a, uh, as, as a child, I have a memory of being half asleep, half awake. My bed shaking a lot in the middle, in, the, in my dream state, kind of. I was just aware of it, but I don't know if it was physical or it was just experience. Can you scan that at all? I don't know if you can provide yes. me any insight on that. What you're experiencing, and this is actually not that uncommon in your society, <clears throat> is that in those states, you are actually shifting interdimensionally. But if you, let's say, put on the brakes, you hold yourself in idle, in between dimensions, vibrating back and forth, you can actually set up a resonance, a feedback resonance in physical reality that will actually cause the objects to sympathetically vibrate with that feedback resonance. Okay. You understand? Yeah, I remember being almost fearful though. I, yes, I, 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 because things were building up. In other words, you have to let the energy go. You okay. have to let yourself make the shift completely. You can't really hold yourself there in between too long. Otherwise, there can be some buildup and some feedback and some blowout of circuits. So the idea of the fear building up was you're reaching the breaking point of your tolerance level. Let it go. That was truly, in that sense, simply a survival mechanism. I see. All right. Make sense? Yes. All right. Thank you, Bashar. Thank you. Bashar, another question from yes. our listeners. Um, this was about distinguishing between the, phys the ego and the higher mind. Well, we have talked about that already. Right. And I guess I just wanted to reinforce this idea that um, in learning to distinguish between the two, yes. if the thoughts that you're receiving are making you feel small, um, frightened, um, uh, decreasing your energy, decreasing your spirit. Is it a good bet that that is your negative ego? It is a good bet, but here's the trick. Again, remember, the ego, the negative ego is clever. The negative ego may give you thoughts that actually make you think you're feeling good. The way to tell the difference, again, is to take that quiet moment and really pay attention to some of the underlying feelings that go with it. In other words, you can actually realize that if the negative ego is feeding you in such a way as to make you think you're feeling good, if you step back and pay attention, you may actually be able to feel the anxiety underlying that. And that's what lets you know it's the negative ego, attempting to trick you into thinking that anxiety is excitement. But generally, eventually, you will find in the physical reflection of your physical reality, in the mirror of physical reality, the negative ego cannot trick you that way for long. Eventually, physical reality, just being a neutral mirror, will show you something isn't working. Therefore, you've got to take a step back and look at what you thought was exciting and make sure that the excitement is genuinely coming from the higher mind and was not just a trick of the negative ego to allow you to avoid something you're actually fearful of. So always, even if you can't tell in the moment, always the physical reality will show you something isn't coherent here. Something will not make sense. Something will be out of alignment. Something will be out of whack, as you say. And it gives you the moment to step back and see if in fact there was actually coherency in what you were getting and where it came from. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm trying to think of I'm an putting it finally this way. Again, when the negative ego generally gives you something that may appear to be excitement, <clears throat> but you find yourself still reacting negatively to circumstances that occur in your outer life, that's a good clue that it wasn't actual excitement, that it was still coming from the negative belief system. I see. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So that's how you know from the reflection that is given to you. Not that the reflection changes, but how you respond to the idea of what's going on in your physical reality as to whether it was a genuine excitement or simply the idea of a disguised anxiety. I see. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Are you approaching your break time? All right. Thank you, Bashar. And to you, good day. Thank you. I have a question about your civilization. Yes. Do members of your civilization often interact with beings of a much, much, much higher density than your own? Much, much, much? Or? Yes. Okay, great. If so, can you describe them in a way that we would be able to understand? Generally speaking, you will find that beings of the idea you call seventh density will be mostly energy constructs, energy forms. They will be patterns of light and electromagnetic 
or electromagnetic energy. They may present themselves in a variety of ways that again are representative of the symbols of the consciousness of the other civilization they are communicating with. Therefore, sometimes the beings that we interact with of that level actually appear to us as multifaceted crystals floating in the air. Because that is the overall consensus reality of what they represent, a multifaceted representation or aspect of all that is. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what have you learned from them recently um, which has assisted in your own individual growth and evolution. Oh, thank you. One of the things we have learned from them recently, as you say, in terms of time, <clears throat> is the idea of how, because in a sense they function as our higher minds, how we can experience their level of reality more and more and more and more in what might be called the lower vibratory levels. What interpretations we can recognize as aspects of their reality that are capable of manifesting in our reality and to interact with them in ways that would let us know we are interacting with them even though they will be cloaked in manifestations of our reality. They are telling us how to see through our own symbols more and more and more to the pure essence of their being. This is, in your language, difficult to describe beyond this point as to how we would perceive their true essence. But the closest approximation perhaps would be as an infinitesimal spark of light in an endless void of emptiness. Excellent. And yet, at the same time, knowing that the infinite void of emptiness is also contained in that infinitesimal spark of light. Thank you. Thank um, you. Another topic. Um, sorry. I'm dying to notice. Um, thank you for appearing in the movie Tuning In. Um, there was also well, I did not appear. The channel's body appeared in it. Thank you for that clarification. Um, there was also another channeler in the movie who claims to channel an extraterrestrial consciousness. And I've heard some audio from them that within the next 15 years, we will cease to have any currency and that we will no longer have a monetary system. I'm just curious to know your perspective on this. As we read the collective energy now, Sometime between your year of 2015 and 2033, you will begin to lay down the basis for the removal or shift or change of the monetary or economic system as it exists now, but that does not mean there will not still be some form of symbolic exchange in that time. So it may not manifest right away, but the foundation of it will begin to be laid in that time. Thank That's you. how we would interpret it by reading the collective energy. Thank you. <clears throat> and Thank you. One more. Um, I've heard that um, there are currently many beings throughout the universe observing and watching us at this time. <clears throat> yes. I'm just curious as to how they are observing us. Are they seeing through our eyes? Do they s just simply have an aerial view? Are they among us and they're just invisible? Or do they observe us like they're watching reality TV? All of the above and more. Thank Depends you. on the being and from where they are observing. Thank you. Excellent. Remember, some beings observe by actually being among you in the sense of having lives, choosing lives among you. In that sense, you could say, I'm observing you that way because the channel is my past life or one of them in your civilization. Okay. Thank you. So that's an observation. Other beings may be using ships. Other beings may simply be using their consciousness. Other beings may be doing this through different dimensional doorways and gates. There are as many ways of observing things as there are kinds of consciousnesses and beings. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll be watching you. <laughs> Um, this person asks, since I'm creating my own reality, I would like to know exactly how I can use feedback from other people to enhance my reality. How can I take advantage of any negativity from other people in a practical way? By considering it to be an offer or a suggestion of an optional way to view yourself 
and taking the advice simply as advice to take the opportunity to see whether or not you are still on track with yourself or whether they are reminding you that some correction, some course correction may be necessary. But once you have made the determination as to whether or not you are in alignment or out of alignment based on their suggestion, you can thank them for the suggestion and decide to do whatever it is you prefer to do. In other words, treat all of that, any criticism, any observation, simply as an opportunity to consider that you may need some alignment, but then make the assessment yourself as to whether that's true for you or not, and thank them for their input, whether you take their advice or not. Okay, it sounds like having a strong core. Of course. Because you understand that you would not have attracted them in your reality if it didn't serve a purpose. So whether it serves the purpose of reminding you that you may not be paying attention to something you need to pay attention to, or whether you've attracted them in your reality to reassure yourself that in fact what they're suggesting has nothing to do with you and that you are steadfast in your assurance of what is your preference, either way you have still attracted them for a reason. So to use them in that positive light, you will get the best out of it, the most out of it. Okay. And you will then be allowing them to have served you in that way. And you can serve them retroactively by letting them know that their advice, in that sense, was accepted with the loving intention with which it was given, even if they didn't think it was given that way. That will really disarm them. <clears throat> All right? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Bashar. And a you good day. Two questions. Um, we, we talk about the ego as if... <clears throat> It is a being with consciousness? Well, in a sense it is. Because your personality construct, to some degree, functions somewhat autonomously once it is created. That's why you can actually negotiate with it in some ways as if it were separate, even though it's not. <clears throat> Did that make sense? Well, I just wonder how does something <clears throat> go from... Uh, the, I guess the, mm, the even bigger question is um, the difference between energy and consciousness is as sort of uh, maybe paradoxical to me as the wave and the, the particle. Yes. Um, so how does something go from not being to being to being a being with consciousness? You, you see All what right, I mean? let's yeah. use an analogy that we often use, and that is the film or movie analogy that exists on your planet. When you are watching a movie, you believe that the characters on the screen, in a sense, have consciousness. Because, in a sense, an actor has given them a voice. But if you actually stop a moment and think about it, you're relating to nothing but a bunch of light. You're relating to an illusion. It's causing you to allow yourself to feel emotions, to think new thoughts, to respond in many ways to what you're seeing on the screen. But what you're seeing is actually not the living actor, nor even a real character. So the idea is similar. You have created a context, a character in context in the ego. You have used consciousness and energy and molded it into a certain pattern in such a way as it actually can be dealt with in an illusionary manner as if it had its own autonomous reality. Make sense? This is for the purpose of creating reflectivity. Make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Well, it does, except, you know, when it turns into a monster. <laughs> yes. Well, some of you like going to horror movies. Well, that, that is a, a, a continued part of this question is um, sometimes I feel extremely angry that yes. somewhere, someplace, some part of me decided it was acceptable to put me in an experience of distress. Yes. You know, from the higher perspective, uh, it expands consciousness and limitation and teaches yes. other beings, and it's yes. oh, oh so good for the rest of the universe, but my moment is misery, yes. um, horror, fear, yes. anger. Yes, yes, um, and, and so... I, and I get angry that I've been yes. put in that position, and I, well, I want to know who put me there. anger, in that sense, is actually the recognition that you put yourself in that position, the anger is from the fact that you're not taking yourself out of it. Because you were not put in the position, you chose it. The anger comes from not being willing to choose something else. So you can use the anger to find out what the belief is that you have bought into that makes you feel like you should not choose something other than 
those negative experiences. That's what the anger comes from. You're angry at yourself for not choosing something different. And you can't figure out why you're not choosing something different because you're not in touch with the belief system that makes it seem all right to continue in the way that you have chosen in the first place. Make sense? Well, if, if myself knew that I could get lost yes, and knew that I might have these terrible experiences <clears throat> and decided to do it anyway, yes. that, but you see, that from seems that to me like a lack of love. But from that perspective, it's not terrible. The idea is it understood that you were going to explore th certain themes. It didn't in any way, shape, or form insist that you had to experience them in a negative way. That just recognized that that might happen because any time you walk into a haunted house, things might jump out at you and you might get momentarily scared. At the same time, if you look behind the illusion and understand that they're just special effects, you don't have to be scared. So the higher self knows that you have the capacity to treat these things as illusions and special effects and not have to choose to be scared, even though it knows originally that you could choose to be scared because you walked into a place that has things that can scare you. But the choice is yours as to how you experience the theme. It's not like any part of yourself forced yourself to have experience negative or scary things. It's showing you that you have the power to transform these things, to see through the illusion. And you're only angry because you haven't done it yet. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I guess it's sometimes hard to understand the layers of the self. And, and yes, know, the, but that's all right. The point is, is to not be angry at yourself for not understanding. That's the first step. And then you give yourself a break and say, it's all right that I don't understand. The paradox is, it has to be all right for you to be angry. It has to be all right for you to not understand in order to actually let go of the anger and to understand. But you're not all right with that. And so what you're doing is you're devaluing an experience. You're devaluing the idea of dark side as a valid experience. And by devaluing it, you're attempting to push it away. And by attempting to push it away, you recognize it becomes a spring that has nowhere to go except to bounce back stronger and stronger and stronger. So the idea is you have to accept that negative experiences are part and parcel of at least what's possible and that they are valid as choices. When you validate that the dark side is a valid choice, then you don't have to choose it. The only reason you're having a tough time getting away from it is because you will not accept that polarity is part of existence. Make sense? How do I, how do I get to the point where I do accept it? The idea, again, is to recognize that without the dark side, you wouldn't know the light. So the darkness gives you the opportunity to actually see what you prefer. Okay. So you have to validate it as having a reason for existing and not judge it to have no place in reality. You contain dark and light. You contain positive and negative. You contain polarity. You always will. Therefore, you have to accept that Part of you is dark and will always be. But you don't have to choose an experience from that side. But the only way to choose an experience only from the positive side is to validate that it's all right if you decide to choose one from the negative side. Once it becomes all right, once the negative side becomes an equally valid choice, then you don't have to choose it. There's no charge on it. There's no onus on it. You're not running away from it. You're letting it live there, but you're not experiencing the effect because you let it be a valid choice, and thus you remove all power from it. You just turn it into a neutral choice. That's all. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I did your um, uh, spiral exercise, the, the gazing tool, Yays. for a few months. Yeah. I don't know if I did it properly, but I did have it. Did you do it your way the best you could? Yes. You did it properly. The experience I had um, was seeing... This 3D persona uh, as a female yes. uh, dropping aside, yes. and a different persona becoming um, available. Yes. So I had a day where the 3D persona went away. Yes. The higher persona took over for maybe a day or two days. All right. And then all was of a sudden, was it fun? Well, the first day I was extremely angry that I felt I had been lied to about who I was. Ah, now here's a question for you. If you created a higher persona that is representative of more joy and more excitement, 
why did you spend the energy and the time focusing negatively instead of spending the time focusing positively and just enjoying the new persona? Why did you choose to stay in the negative energy and spend time berating yourself for having spent time in the negative side unless you prefer to spend time there? Yeah, I have no idea. It, yes, it, you do. It felt like it just happened. No, it does not. And that's where you're fooling yourself. You just have to be willing to let it be all right to have done that. And that will open up a doorway that will let you understand why you choose to do that. And then you will no longer be angry with yourself. You have to stop being angry with yourself for choosing to be angry, for choosing a <laughs> negative experience. And then you will allow yourself to find out what the underlying belief mechanism is that gets you to think that that's the thing to choose. And then once you know that, you won't choose it anymore. But you have to start by letting it be all right to have chosen it and not be angry with yourself for having chosen it and not being angry with yourself for being angry. Because you're only heaping more inability to understand why the mechanism is there by choosing to spend time in the negative energy instead of the positive. It doesn't just happen to you, it happens through you. All right? <clears throat> so lighten up on yourself for having created the idea of negative experiences. That's the first step to transforming them. You have to let it be all right to have done so. If you're not all right with it, you never will be all right. All right? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, Bashar. And to you, good day. I'm very grateful to be able to interact with you today. We thank you for the co-creation of the interaction. Um, and I wanted to take the opportunity to, because I've been seeing you since I was a child, yeah, yes, yes. to let you know that although, I'm sure you know on some level, but... Um, that although I haven't always been in the awareness state, maybe to accept all the information you are giving me, that... Um, well, all you need to accept is all the information you wish to accept. Okay. Well, then let me say that through um, <coughs> recording equipment and being able to play these things back, I've been able to understand on a deeper level, and I appreciate that. All right. Well, we thank you, and we appreciate your willingness to do that for yourself. Okay, thank you. Because that makes all the difference in the world. Yes. Literally. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, yes. a question about frequency. Frequency. And vibration. And vibration. Now you speak of this often, and for you, you've said that it's um, a pretty much how you do everything, how you go from place to place in your ships. And yes, we shift frequencies. Yes. Everyone is doing that anyway. Right. We're just conscious of it and in that sense can direct it in the way that we prefer to. Okay. So my question then yes. is um, what is the medium? You refer to vibration. What is it that is actually vibrating or that has frequency? Consciousness. Consciousness. So then would that Consciousness be in that sense manifests energy and in the energy matrix in the energy medium there is vibration it's a self reflective creation consciousness in that sense knows itself and in knowing itself in reflecting upon itself in a sense what is called a vesica pisces is created and in that vesica pisces in that intersection of the reflection of consciousness on itself is created a different density of consciousness. And that different density of consciousness is what you call energy. And in the energy is the vibration that is representative of the intention of the consciousness reflecting on itself. Okay. Did that makes sense in your language. I'm going to have to listen to it on the recording, but yes. All right. <laughs> um, now, uh, as far as... I had a question about what we call the harmonic series. Yes. Um, the f well, as I understand it, as the fact that as you play one particular frequency or musical note, um, other <coughs> intervals to that particular frequency or, or, or note will vibrate. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? In harmony and, with it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, just naturally resonate. Um, yes. Now, I wonder if you make use of that in any way or if that has any implications or further use. Um, we do make use of that, but for us, it is a relatively automatic function. We don't think about it. 
It's just part and parcel of what creates the synchronicity in our reality, and we're aware that it does. We're aware of all the harmonic vibrations in our collective energy that are responsible for manifesting certain synchronicities, but for the most part, we don't really think about it. We're aware of it. We know it's there. We recognize it, but we don't think about it. Okay. Well, kind of like us then, <laughs> musically. <laughs> yes. Because when you are listening to a musical piece in that way, you don't really think about it. You just experience it. Right. You experience what it moves within you, and you move with it. Okay. So in that sense, our entire civilization, by simply flowing with those moments and those movements and those harmonics, as we move, we know that we are simply in one gigantic dance. Okay. Make sense? Um, yeah. Does that help you? Yes, it does. Anything else? Um, just briefly, if I could ask if there's any information from guides or anything you could bring through. Briefly. <laughs> One moment. Do you have a favorite color? Is it blue? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then look to those frequencies and their corresponding tonal qualities in sound to create the kind of music you're looking to create. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And now we can hear the vibration of a lot of your stomachs grumbling. <clears throat> Enjoy your break for nourishment. We will resume this transmission after your break.